Good morning. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> All right. Well, of course, you always think of extra stuff. Like, oh, yeah, I got to, you know. So, anyway. I think I'm on, so I think we'll start. Um, so let's uh, bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this church and everyone who's here, and I pray your richest blessings upon this time that we're going to spend together with you. And Lord, we lift up to you now our country, and Lord, there is so much despair. And I pray, Lord, that you would make us alert to the faces of despair. And Lord, we can only see half their faces. Help us, Lord, to know the eyes of despair as we go out and about. And Lord, give us the words to say so that we can speak your love and your peace to the hearts of those who are in despair. And Lord, um, give us the boldness that we need, the courage to speak your word and words of love and words of peace, but words of truth. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you would bless this church. And I know you have just the right person picked out for us, for our pastor. And, uh, Lord, we just look forward to having your man in our pulpit, in your timing. And I pray, again, that you would bless this uh, lesson. I pray, Lord, that I would say your words and do your deeds. And I pray that we would, each and every one of us, have willing spirits, understanding minds, and hearts that are open to you. And I ask all of this in your precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, I'm going to start out just by reading a passage. Um, so on uh, page 22 in our Sunday school lesson, um, Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 13. Actually, it's the whole chapter. It's a short chapter. Um, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, Who should I send? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. And he replied, Go, say to these people, Keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. Make the minds of these people dull. Deafen their ears and blind their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their minds, turn back and be healed. Then I said, Until when, Lord? And he replied, Until cities lie in ruins without inhabitants, houses are without people, the land is ruined and desolate, and the Lord drives the people far away, leaving great emptiness in the land. Though a tenth will remain in the land, it will be burned again, like the terebinth or the oak that leaves a stump when felled, that the holy seed is the stump. Um, I just want to say first that the, the lesson writer for this lesson is very, very good, and the two lessons that I taught out of Proverbs, and I meant to say with both of those lessons, you know, 
read your lesson. There's a lot of good information that I'm not going to be covering um, in, this, in this lesson. Um, the, uh, uh, the one thing that I kind, kind of, well, hmm, not sure of that the, les the lesson writer speaks of this as being a vision that, that I, this is, was all just a vision that Isaiah had, but he doesn't really say anywhere in here that it's a vision. And, and I fully believe that Isaiah could really have seen the Lord. Um, some um, uh, theologians that I've uh, read or listened to in the past have said that uh, they thought that Isaiah was a priest and he was actually in the temple at the time that he had this vision, possibly even in the Holy of Holies in which uh, only one priest uh, who was selected by lot each year would go in there on the Day of Atonement. Uh, and perhaps that he was in the Holy of Holies when he saw this vision. Um, the, uh, this is a very special passage for me. I can remember, just, well, I don't know the exact date, but uh, I was a, a young teenager, maybe 13, possibly 14, may, maybe even a preteen uh, of 12, when I first read this passage and the impact that it had on me, it's like the chills just went up down my spine or uh, the disciples uh, on the day of resurrection who were uh, walking to Emmaus and uh, unbeknownst to them, Jesus caught up with them and he says, why are you so sad? And they said, you know, where have you been? You know, uh, and they told him all about the crucifixion and now his body is missing out of the grave and nobody knows what's going on. And he began to explain to them from the scriptures um, how all of this was necessary that the Messiah would uh, be executed and then rise again on the third day. And when they got to where they were going, he says, why don't you stay and eat with us? And as was customary, they asked him to bless the meal. And uh, as soon as he blessed it, they recognized who he was and he disappeared from their sights. And they said to one another, how our hearts burned when we heard him talking to us on the road to Emmaus. Um, and that's kind of the ex experience that I had. It was next to my salvation experience. Uh, it was one of the first experiences I had where I, I just really felt the presence of the Lord. And one of the things that really um, uh, stood out to me was how merciful the Lord was when Isaiah confessed, I'm a man of unclean lips. And uh, how that uh, uh, the angel had put the coal to his lips and uh, obviously uh, as an agent of the Lord and that uh, Isaiah's sin was taken away and just the, uh, uh, I just was kind of awestruck so uh, as, as I teach these passages there's a lot of them going to be saying oh this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible well this is another one I, I guess I have a lot of I've lived long enough I have a lot of favorite passages so this is one of them um, the uh, now, the translator, uh, where they say the, uh, called God the Lord of the armies, and uh, in the King James it says Lord of hosts, and maybe I'm just an old fuddy-duddy. Uh, I kind of like the King James better. Uh, to me, Lord of armies says he's just, you know, the God of the military, uh, where hosts is kind of more inclusive. It's like a huge innumerable number of, um, of people, and it couldn't could include all sorts of people besides just military who are serving God and uh, in their way uh, fighting uh, for God's kingdom. Um, the, uh, I want to look a little more closely at that passage where um, Isaiah says he sees the Lord and uh, he says, woe is me for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. He recognized that his culture had influenced him and he kind of went along with some of the weaknesses in his culture. And uh, we influence each other, we do. And uh, some years ago there was a controversy because there was a noted um, athlete, I, I, if I remember correctly, I think he was a basketball player. Uh, basketball is not a sport that I follow so I I can't remember exactly, but he said that he didn't want to be a role model. And I'm thinking, eh. Uh, <laughs> everybody is a role model. If you have a very small circle of influence, you're going to be a role model to a small uh, number of people. But if you're a professional athlete who uh, plays 
on nationwide television, you're going to have a very large circle of influence. So your decision is not whether you're going to be um, a role model or not. Your decision is whether you're going to be a good role model or a bad role model. Uh, so um, uh, Isaiah, uh, you know, as he saw the Lord, what happens is the more clearly you can see God, the more clearly you can see yourself. And uh, there are certainly all these other passages in Scripture uh, where people uh, actually had a chance to see the Lord. And uh, uh, Moses in Exodus, uh, Lord, I want to see your glory. And uh, God explained, you know, no one can see my face and live, but uh, I'm going to hide you in a cleft of the rock, and as I pass by, I'll put my hand over, the, over your face so that you can't see my face. But then as I pass by, I'll take my hand away, and you can see the backside of me, and you can see the backside of my glory. Um, and, of course, that glory was so glorious that when Moses came down from the mountain, his face shone, and he didn't even realize it. People were like, ah, what? Uh, who, who is this? What happened to you? Um, and over time, it, it faded away. Um, Ezekiel, uh, I mean, he just pretty much starts out the whole book of Ezekiel, with the, in the first chapter is all about seeing the Lord, and he describes in great detail. Um, Daniel, uh, and of course Ezekiel also reports that uh, he, he saw the Lord and he, he fainted. He fell down on his face, and uh, you know, the, the, they had, the angel had to come and pick him back up. Uh, Daniel saw the Lord and uh, fell on his face as if dead. And uh, then the, the a angel reached down and touched him and put strength back into his body and stood him up on his feet. Um, the Apostle John uh, in uh, uh, Revelations, and after he's uh, recorded the lessons to the churches, then he goes up into heaven and he uh, sees the Lord, and he also uh, falls down and loses consciousness. Uh, it just it strikes great fear. Um, but also, you you see yourself as you really are, the, as you when you see when you see God, and I believe that this is, is a very useful uh, tool in evangelism. Um, <coughs> we need to present the God. The, uh, we need to present the Lord Jesus Christ. The more faithfully we present the Lord Jesus Christ, um, and the more more in a way that, that people can more clearly see Jesus, then they'll more be more clearly able to see themselves and their need of salvation. Um, so, uh, and, and there are a lot of, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of us are trying to witness to some really tough people um, and uh, people who have maybe rejected the Lord uh, at other times in, in other ways. But just present the Lord Jesus to them. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Um, the uh, also as a child, um, when I read this passage and they talked about the the coal and it was a live coal because the scripture says it was a glowing coal, uh, and it was touched to his lips. I just thought it was kind of all symbolic, and uh, God, it was a, it was a way of God kind of. Uh, symbolically waving a magic wand and uh, Isaiah's sin was magically taken away from him. Uh, but now uh, I had read something else recently that uh, said if, if this is something that really happened to Isaiah and that was a real live coal that was really touched to his lips that uh, it would burn his lips. There would be a smell of something burning uh, and there would be the pain and then when that healed, possibly there was scarring on his lips to always remind him of his encounter with the Lord and how the Lord feels about unclean lips. And I don't have to explain what that means. I think we're, we're all adults and we know what that means. Um, the other thing is that, uh, uh, and I, I, I alluded to it earlier, that uh, says, now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed uh, and your sin is atoned for. Um, the idea that, that our 
sin can be totally removed is awesome. Now, this word iniquity, and I think we all know it's roughly a synonym for sin, but it's my understanding that uh, iniquity is that sin, it's the inward sin, the sin of our motives and our attitudes, inward. And sometimes maybe things that aren't really visible to people on the outside, things that we keep hidden, but God knows it or it's there. So, uh, uh, and then um, the second half of that, and your sin is atoned for, in the King James it says your sin is purged. Now sin would be more the outward actions, the outward it, it, iniquity. It starts in your heart and then it comes out as sin in your outward behavior and words. And uh, in the King James, it says that your sin is purged. And boy, that word purged means to take everything out of you. Uh, Stalin, uh, when he thought that there were people in his government that weren't 100% loyal to him, he purged all of them. He, he totally got rid of them. Uh, when maybe we eat something that, that makes us sick and we're very sick, and one of the uh, old-time remedies was to purge you of everything that's in your digestive system. Uh, it, that means to get everything out of you. And so God is able to take everything sinful out of us. God is able to, to uh, get rid of all of our sin. We can't really deal with our sin, but God has all power. And uh, what was supposed to be our memory verse for last week is uh, another one of my favorite verses, um, uh, Isaiah uh, let's see, I've gone too far. Um, oh, good. It's right here. Um, Isaiah 1.18, uh, and it says, Come now and let us reason together, uh, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And uh, uh, Psalm 51 has another beautiful verse that... Uh, has really blessed me in times past. Um, and this is the psalm of, uh, of David's great confession uh, following his confrontation by the prophet uh, Nathan over uh, stealing Uriah's wife Bathsheba and then uh, causing Uriah uh, to be murdered. And uh, let's see. Here we go. Um, Psalm 51, verse 9. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Again, God just totally gets rid of it. Uh, Psalm 103. And uh, a passage hopefully everyone is uh, uh, familiar with. Verse 12. Um, As far as the east is from the west, uh, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Uh, and then the Bible also talks about the remission of sins. Oh, that word remission is a wonderful word. It means to send away. God can send away all of our sins. That, it, to me, is just so awesome. Uh, and, of course, good old 1 John 1.9. Uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, and also, then when we look after uh, Isaiah's been cleansed, and uh, it says that uh, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for, uh, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, Who shall I send who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Um, before we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, we need first to be cleansed. Uh, there needs to be room for the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I've used this analogy before, but I'm going to use it again. Uh, our life can be, um, an analogy would be to liken our life to a glass. And when you pour the water in, the water is the Holy Spirit. But if your glass is full of rocks, there's not very much room for the for the water, for the Holy Spirit. And first you have to get the rocks out. So first, you, you, if you want to ask the Lord for the filling of the Holy Spirit, first you have to ask for his cleansing. 
and uh, uh, and then there's room for the Holy Spirit. So Isaiah was cleansed, and now he was ready. Um, uh, he was ready and, and willing and able to say, here I am, send me. If first there hadn't been that cleansing, uh, he certainly wouldn't have felt uh, worthy or able or anything to do what God was asking. Um, the, uh, in, in the Bible, uh, they used two things to cleanse, and one is water, and that we're kind of familiar with that, but the other one is fire. The fires of affliction can be very um, cleansing. And uh, Numbers 31, 23, talks about this in uh, both of these. Let's see. 31, there we go. Okay. And this is as they're uh, going to be taking the land, and, um, and I think even prior to going into the land, there were some battles that uh, Moses helped to direct with those who were opposing them as they were moving towards the promised land land and uh, you know they could go in and and take the spoil but uh, you know these were pagan towns and Moses was saying everything's got to be cleansed first uh, so he says everything that may abide the fire ye shall make it go through the fire and it shall be clean nevertheless it shall be purified with the water of separation and all that abideth not the fire ye shall make go through the water. So here he's saying uh, things have to be purified and either fire or water. Um, okay. And then um, this passage down here, he says, uh, where God says, uh, go say to these people, keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. Make the minds of these people dull, deafen their ears and blind their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their minds, turn back and be healed. And I can remember when I first read that, and I'm thinking, huh? I mean, doesn't God want people to understand and turn to him? Uh, and I, and uh, the writer of the lesson, uh, and I think it's the day four, um, uh, he says, uh, verse 9 contains the oddest mes message one could imagine God giving to his prophet. I agree with that. But in thinking about it, um, it put me in mind of Romans chapter 1. Towards the end of that chapter, um, the Apostle Paul is describing people who have deliberately rejected the Lord. Um, and so what happens when you deliberately reject the Lord? Let's see. Romans. Okay. Um, just kind of, I'm going to skip around. Uh, so verse 21. Um, for when they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened or hardened. Uh, that uh, they hardened their hearts by deliberately rejecting God. And uh, then skipping to verse 30, 24, 24, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. And uh, then um, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. And then 26, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. And then verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. So um, you deliberately reject God and... Uh, God's going to give you over to, uh, you know, you don't want to worship me, okay? Uh, and this is kind of what he's saying that uh, um, 
that's going to be happening. Isaiah is going to be, uh, anyway, th th this is what happens. The people are going to deliberately reject me, and then their heart is uh, going to reach the point that they can't understand. Um, and going back to uh, the issue of evangelism, you're witness to some, witnessing to someone, and they reject the gospel. Every time they reject the gospel, they harden their hearts. And the more times they reject the gospel, the more they've hardened their hearts. Well, if we're trying to reach them, we don't want them to harden their hearts. And the scripture that has uh, kind of um, led me, um, well, I, I don't need the, uh, to look it up. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, and we're in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and, and rend you or tear you, tear you up. Um, and, of course, the, the pig and the dog were very unclean animals uh, in the Jewish uh, law. Um, but not only that, I mean, they were animals. They're not able to understand or to appreciate the, the value of what you're offering to them. So when they reject it, uh, then you, know, you don't keep trying to throw pearls before swine. Uh, they, have, uh, they have shown themselves to be enemies of God. Okay, how are we to treat our enemies? Uh, let's go back a couple of chapters in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, uh, uh, verse 43, verses 43 and 44. Um, I may have to look that one, that one up. Um, I could have quoted it one time, but I don't know if I can quote all of it right now. Um, okay. Ye, ha, uh, ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Whoa. So it's a different, very, very different kind of witnessing. Um, uh, anybody ever curse at you? Respond with a blessing that uh, I pray God will bless you greatly and that you will come to know him. Uh, bless, don't curse. Um, and you, you pray for them, you do good to them. Even though they do, do bad to you, you do good to them. Uh, and uh, in the previous uh, passage, it's, it talks about uh, turning the other cheek. If, you, if somebody hits you, going the extra mile, someone forces you to do uh, something that's not in this case it's talking about an unjust law a very discriminatory law and they not only were to obey the discriminatory law but go above and beyond uh, so uh, these are all uh, to show us as being so different from the world it's another kind of witness uh, you're not witnessing with your words you're witnessing with your actions in, in times of conflict uh, now, in our culture today, is there conflict? Yeah. So uh, maybe a good, uh, uh, re um, a good reminder. Uh, finally, the last verse, verse 13, and th these previous verses have been kind of depressing. You know, people aren't going to listen. People aren't going to uh, understand what you're trying to tell them. Uh, but he, God talks about a remnant, the holy seed that uh, he would keep a people faithful to himself. And out of those would come uh, the Messiah one day, uh, that God was not giving up on us. Uh, okay. And uh, I think last time I went over a little bit, I had a passage that was like good for three lessons. And this time I have a passage that's basically one lesson. Um, does anybody have any comments or uh, questions or anything, discussion? Anybody? Okay, well, uh, I'm going to.
close in prayer, and I guess we'll have some uh, time as we prepare our hearts for the service to come. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for your love and your care. Forgive me, Lord, that I haven't uh, been a very good servant to you. Forgive me, Lord, that I procrastinate. Forgive me that uh, I don't manage my time well. And I pray, Lord, that I would uh, increase my time for prayer. I pray that I would serve you better. Lord, you know my weaknesses. And Lord, I need you to be my strength and my energy, my courage and my confidence. Um, Lord, I just need you every moment of every day. And I pray your blessings upon each one here. I pray your blessings upon the service to come and on the one who's going to be bringing the message, that you would just speak through them, speak through them, speak through them. I pray that you would play through Cindy, and I pray that you would sing through us and pray through us, that you would be our prayer and our praise and just remove every unrighteous thing and then fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we would be whom you'd have us to be and do what you'd have us to do. And I ask all of these things in your precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen.